There was a time in my life when I wanted to climb mountains. But one thing I quickly learned was that as much as I loved the achievement and exhilaration of summiting, mountain climbing is both incredibly difficult and incredibly dangerous. A pursuit where at times equal parts, luck and skill, are necessary to stay alive. And it's this aspect of the sport that caused me to pause and reflect. Is the personal reward justified against the risk of death? And for me, the answer was maybe not. For now at least. But every year, there would come a time when I would ask myself the same question. If you could, would you climb Everest? To be honest, I wasn't sure. Watching climbers line up on the Hillary step every year, impatiently waiting their turn for personal glory, I wondered at their motivations. I wondered if in those moments of pain and exhaustion, as they struggle past the bodies of the hundreds that didn't make it, if they felt it was all worth it. It's nagged at me privately for a long time. How would I feel as my body slowly dies in the death zone? In that moment, would I regret my decision to climb the world's highest mountain? I honestly didn't know. But I felt the only way to really know for sure would be to see it for myself to stand there and look up and see that and know in the pit of my stomach and my heart of hearts whether it's worth dying for. So I mean I don't know if it's a stupid question but why can't you drive to Lukla directly? There is no road. There's just no road. No road. Yeah. yeah. Maybe right. soon it may take like a few more years after that yeah. we can drive up to there. <coughs> I'm planning something different to Lukla. Oh, From yeah. here, we should make a rail until Lukla. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that would be nice. Yeah. Easy. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's our plane behind us and it looks like they're currently working frantically to fix the landing gear So hopefully that's okay Finally getting on the plane Woo, We are ready <laughs> Everyone has their own reason. They make the trek to the world's highest mountain. An adventure, a challenge, to see Everest, to remember a lost friend. And I have mine. Over the next 15 days, I'm going to cover 150 kilometers of the highest terrain in the world and experience the greatest challenge of my life. But as my tiny plane ascends into these towering valleys, I get the sense that this journey will be something more than what I came for. As the wheels touch down in Lukla, I'm pinching myself that I'm really here, but I'm also sensing something different. I'm just not sure what the feeling is. But all I know is the answers lie somewhere up there, in the clouds. My planned path is the famous Gokyo Ri route which is longer and more difficult than the traditional one taken by a majority of trekkers. But those up for the challenge will be rewarded with unparalleled beauty. However, as I would find out, that beauty comes with its own risks. I had no idea that I would be pushed to the very edge of my limits. The oxygen level was about, was mid to low 70s all night. And by the end, would come to appreciate that these high mountains 
while beautiful, are deadly, and any mistake or lapse in judgment can cost you not only your trek, but also your life. The first two days of the trek consisted of following the valley up from Lukla, stopping in Phak Ding for the night, before the climb to Namche Bazaar, along the way crossing the famous Hillary Swing Bridge. Namche Bazaar is the first settlement of the Khumbu Valley, which extends all the way to Everest. It's hard to believe a place like this exists up here in the mountains, two days hike. Perched on the edge of a mountain valley, Namche Bazaar stole my heart immediately with its winding cobbled streets. And after two days elevation gain, an acclimatization day is necessary. Today, I take a day hike up to Everest viewpoint to catch my first glimpse of the world's highest peak. Behind me we get our first peak of Everest, which I don't know if my finger's in the right spot, but it's behind that mountain there and that ridge line. And also, to visit Sagamata next, with their turning mountain waste into art, and also helping the current generation of trekkers and climbers change their mindset on Everest. 1991, 375 people had summited Everest in the first 38 years. That's like approximately 10 per year. From 1991 to today, that's 31 years. So the last 20 years it has exploded. <laughs> yeah, the Denali Foundation uh, invited us to come and or invited me to come and I said I, I gotta come with a team because what they wanted was something, a sculpture that would draw people in off the path, kind of tell their story in, in, in sculptural format and so I uh, brought an employee and my, um, well two employees yeah. and uh, mm -hmm. and then we were able to make a, lo a lot of sculptures out of waste that we gathered from Namchi and Kumjung and Simboche and and just the construction of this building and uh, it includes anything from household appliances to crashed helicopter parts and and uh, inside the waste lab you'll see we've made a couple more smaller little pieces that are just kind of like landscapes made out of roofing material yeah no it's been it's been such a great experience um, i mean we're living right here with the host family and so we're very steeped in the the culture yeah. and the people and the food and the beauty all <laughs> yeah. around us, right? So it's been very, very inspiring and such a good, good awesome. thing to do and an amazing uh, place to be a part of. Yeah, I hope you guys absolutely. enjoy your time. Yeah. The weather gods continued to be on my side as day four dawned with another crystal clear blue sky. Today, the trek really begins in earnest as I make my way from Namche Bazaar to Dole, a 600 meter elevation gain. I'm surprised by the quality of the track, even finding paved steps in some areas. So far, beautiful walk up, absolutely beautiful. This is just part of the view. Um, some good steps there, good little workout. As you can see, there's not railing the whole way along some of these spots, so don't look down. I can't believe it. I find myself continually left awestruck by the sheer beauty of this place. Villages hanging on the edge of mountains, accessible only by foot and helicopter. Today, I'll be taking a fork and splitting from the main Everest trail and taking the alternative route towards Gokyo, stopping overnight at the River Lodge Tea House in Dole. On this trek, I'm carrying all my own gear and camera equipment, and I'm not using any porters. My pack weighing around 20 kilos. It's today that I get my first taste of how difficult this journey will be. I wake day five with a mild headache. The first signs of my body 
struggling to adapt to the altitude. At this point, there's no reason to be alarmed, but after the previous day's elevation gain, a rest day today is a good idea. So I decide to use this opportunity to put on my day pack and explore the area surrounding Dole. One thing I absolutely love is that if you stay on the tourist trail, I mean the Everest trek, yeah, you're gonna see tourist related things. But if you go just off, everything else is pretty much completely untouched. I've just walked off the main trail a short distance and you can see here basically what this is. It's more or less an abandoned farm, I guess. So what they used to do is when they would come through with sheep or yaks, they'd stop overnight here and this would be a place that they could keep them when they moved on. But now, I guess, times have changed and they no, long, they no longer do that. Um, but, you know, pretty special place. Now I'm going to head over there and see what I can find. After a day spent taking it easy, I was eager to get started the following day. At this point, I had no idea that this night's sleep would be my last for some time. My planned route on day six was Dole to Machermo, a small settlement supposed to be a four to five hour walk from Dole. Arriving in Machermo after only an hour and a half, buoyed on by others I met on the trail and feeling physically very strong, I decided to continue on to Gokyo, a departure from my plan and a further five hours and significantly large jump in elevation, bringing my daily total to 700 meters. You get the sense of how isolated you are. Uh, there's not many people around now. The direction I'm heading, straight up there. That's where I'm gonna find Gokyo. And I think what I'm going to do is stay there for two nights because I'm gonna be making an elevation gain today of probably six or 700 meters, which is quite high in one day. Um, so you can see I have to follow this path up here. It's a good climb up into the mountains. And then yeah, I think I'll stay tonight at Gokyo. Then there's a day hike tomorrow up to Gokyo Ri, which apparently is stunning. Then I'll stay back in Gokyo again. Then I guess the glacier and the pass and um, just play it by ear and see what other people are doing that are there. But yeah. This is the sense of isolation I kind of was looking for on this trek. But it just makes you think, tread carefully. What was intended to be a straightforward day became a long, very difficult climb. But the scenery as I made my way up the Kumbu Valley had me constantly pinching myself. The tree line gave way to sparse, open alpine areas and stunning crystal clear alpine lakes. I shared the path with only a few porters and the odd trekker descending the other way. However, this day's elevation would take its toll. My error in judgment, departing from my plan, would put not only my trek, but also my very life at risk. Okay, if I don't look good, it's because I don't really feel good. Um, last night I had a shit sleep. Uh, the altitude has got me a little bit. Um, I ended up going up about 700 meters yesterday, which is quite a lot, sort of more than the recommended amount. Um, had a bit of a horrible headache all night. And my oxygen level was about, was mid to low 70s all night. Um, my watch has a meter on it, so I can figure that out. Today it's come up a bit. I am feeling a bit better. Um, but yeah, it's very cold and, um, you know, it's no joke. It's no joke. But, um, yeah, today, so what I'm going to do, I've got a day to acclimatize here, which is really good. What I'm going to do is get out, maybe do a bit of a walk, not nothing too strenuous, but get some elevation, um, and then come back down to sleep tonight. And that's really good for acclimatization. So... <laughs> Thank you.
So today what I'm going to do is Renjo Pass, which is right next to Gokyo, you can see behind me, and this hill I'm sitting on right here, that's Gokyo Re, and tomorrow I'm going to hike right up the top of that, and that's where you get the most spectacular Everest views from anywhere, even from on Everest itself. But yeah, so right now, hiking around the bottom of Gokyo Re, and there's a pass which we're going to go up around the corner here. Um, I'm not quite sure what elevation it goes to, but I think probably over 5,000 meters. So we're getting to some pretty serious height. Um, but yeah, I just stopped here for a moment and I've just been sitting here just taking this in. It's just so peaceful and calm and that's what it's all about really, isn't it? see it zigzagging up that ridge line you might just be able to make out the little stick figures of people and here in the foreground you can see the superhuman Nepalese porters these guys are mind-blowing the amount of weight they carry just in jandals or thongs <laughs> they certainly put us to shame Gokyo is one of the highest settlements in the world at 4,750 metres above sea level and would have to be without doubt the most beautiful place I've ever seen. Despite feeling the niggling effects of acute mountain sickness or AMS, once I got moving I actually felt good. Without my pack I was able to make the day climb up Renjo Pass with little difficulty, eventually topping out at 5,300 metres. In the view of the valley, Gokyo Lake, and arguably one of the best views of Mount Everest, made the day hike well worth it. My hope being that by gaining altitude, then descending down to sleep again in Gokyo, my body would have a chance to acclimatise. I was wrong. And what followed was without doubt the worst night of my life. My oxygen levels at this point had dropped to around 70%. And the effects of this were headaches, insomnia, nausea, and if I'm honest, it was scary. If your oxygen levels suddenly crash below this in the night, it can be a very dangerous situation. Helicopters can't fly at night, so evacuation is impossible. Many trekkers have lost their lives in this exact way. I knew the risks, but now, they felt very real. To be clear, any person can get altitude sickness. It doesn't matter how fit, young or healthy you are. Managed incorrectly, acute mountain sickness can progress into HAPE, which is high altitude pulmonary edema, or HACE, high altitude cerebral edema, both of which, if untreated, will result in death. An attempt at Gokyo Re the following day saw me turn back around 5,000 meters with just a complete inability to get enough oxygen into my body. For the first time, I was faced with the very real possibility that I may have to abandon my trek. I turned back to Gokyo, feeling like I was running out of options. I took on a lot of fluid and suddenly it seemed I may have turned a corner. So I left Gokyo for my next destination, Thang Nang, which at the same altitude as Gokyo should hopefully give me another day's acclimatization. But this section was no small feat, consisting of a three hour crossing across a crumbling, ever changing non Zupa glacier. There is no set path here as the glacier is constantly shifting, meltwater causing cavernous openings through the ice. The few that crossed today did so as quickly and carefully as possible. A fall here as the sun sets for the day with no cell phone coverage, no helicopters and minus 20 overnight temperatures would likely be unsurvivable.
Last night offered me little respite for my altitude sickness. I feel as exhausted as I've ever felt after 48 hours with zero sleep, and today provides no rest as I tackle the biggest single day of the trek, the famous Chola Pass, which is a summit pass reaching a height of 5,420 meters. Apparently, we need to go over there, which doesn't really look possible the highest point of the trek. It connects the settlements of Thagnang and Zhongla, today's destination, and features a very tricky near vertical section which offers no room for error. My first view of the pass left me shocked that this was indeed the route, but the sheer scale of this place had made the narrow walkway invisible from a distance. Ascending this section was extremely difficult, but incredibly rewarding. Taking deep, rapid breaths, followed by slow, tiny steps. Cresting the top of the pass, revealed a stunning glacier and equally awe-inspiring valleys and glacial lakes that followed. This truly is heaven on earth. Welcome to the town of Lumbashe, altitude 4,930 meters. Everest Base Camp is that way, about six hours hike. But I thought what I might show you is a little bit through what you can expect to see in one of these Himalayan settlements, small towns. Now this one's a little bit bigger than some of the others, but I thought we could have a wander through and I can show you some of the things you can expect to see, what a tea house might look like. It might be better or it might be worse than what you're expecting, but um, yeah, let's go take a look. So as you can see, we can already see coming into the town, we've got one tea house here and another here. Some of them, they call themselves guest houses, tea houses, hotels, all kinds of things. Um, but each one of these is going to have accommodation, uh, normally double rooms, and you're going to have a dining room that's going to be running a yak dung fire. And at night, everyone gathers around that. and that's where uh, everyone eats their food and socializes to some degree. Now you have to remember that pretty much everything in these places is built, has been transported here by yaks and porters right from Lukla all the way back down the bottom. Some things are brought from by helicopter but not much because the expense is just too high. Um, so when you look at things just remember everything is brought here in that way. 
all the bits of iron and everything that you'll see on the roof, most of this was brought by people or yaks. The stones are all cut locally on site. Up here you'll see a lot of these solar warmers which seem very popular and obviously quite good. A local store with a few basic supplies. Um, that's not common in all of the places we've been to but obviously it is here. One thing that becomes pretty difficult when you're up at this altitude and that is getting your laundry done um, because it's obviously freezing cold. The nights at the moment are getting to about minus 10 inside um, so you have a very narrow window if, you, window if you do want to get some washing done and as you can see people have lined that up there. Right now what we can see out the other side here some more lodges primarily what you're going to see is lodges just as a gentle reminder of how cold it is. The water does not stay in its liquid form for too long around here. Yeah, I mean that's basically taken us through through this small settlement of Lombuche. But like I said, it's bigger than most that we've stayed at. And up behind us here is going to be the path to Everest Base Camp. As usual, the views are spectacular. After a cup of tea, I take the short hike up to view the nearby Kumbu Glacier, which was a perfect way to finish the penultimate day of my journey to Everest Base Camp. I felt great today, and that really let me consider the moment and appreciate where I am. But as night fell, I couldn't help but feel the anticipation build for what the morning would bring. about 20 past 7 and uh, yeah she's pretty cold maybe around minus 5 or something like that enough to chill the willy a bit um, so we're walking straight up a valley now and it's the Everest Base Camp Highway there's a fair few people on the track compared to what we've seen on the rest of our trick you can sense a certain level of excitement and uh, anticipation it's a beautiful day as you can see so the plan is a couple hours we get to go up ship drop our packs then we go on with small packs or no packs to EBC take that in come back and then it's back to up to Kalapatar for sunset we will get the real views of Everest so eagerly anticipating what should be a fantastic day life is what you make it if you want it to mean nothing it can mean nothing but if you want to make it something, it can be everything. Everyone has their own reasons they make the trek to the world's highest mountain. A challenge, an adventure, to see Everest, to remember a friend, 
and I have mine. I came here to make a decision. Whether I wanted to climb the world's highest mountain. Whether I'd be willing to risk my life just to stand there. To say I've been there. As I make my way up the final steps towards base camp, I think about the journey I've been on. How difficult it was to get here. And how easy it was to nearly throw it all away. For some, base camp is an anti-climax. As if they're expecting some monumental structure ready to celebrate them for their achievement. I pity these people. Those who can't find a deeper meaning in life and the way we live it and the moments it's made up of. Meeting those on their way down throughout this trek, they were quick to make it clear to me how difficult it was to come, as if this would fill me with some kind of fear and dread, but my simple answer was, I hope so. I wanted it to be hard. For me, life should be a constant battle, to constantly be pushing yourself to be better, to achieve more in the time you have. Life shouldn't be easy, but it can become that if you let it. I had managed to give meaning to this trek, to reaching Everest beyond my original mission. As I walked those final steps, I found myself thinking about my life and the journey I've been on. And somehow it felt synonymous to this moment that the mountain I'd climbed in my 39 years was reaching a point, the birth of my first son only months away, and how this would be a whole new mountain to climb with its own moments of triumph and struggle. And as I walked, I let my glasses hide the few tears. Not those that are tinged with sadness, but those that are full of joy. So I remembered the precious cargo I carried all this way, from New Zealand to the highest mountain in the world. Because the truth is, I'd made a promise to my best friend, man's best friend, that I'd bring a piece of him here after he passed. And I was keeping that promise. This prayer flag is for Ashley, for letting me live my dreams, for my unborn child. Every one of these is a dream that you should chase and make a reality. And. Uh, my boy Sempi, I miss you.